Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight, Lord God, for your love. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that we, we can gather, Lord, even though we have a, park, a packed parking lot and maybe we have to walk a block. Lord, we thank you that we have your house to turn, turn to. Uh, we can come, Lord God. We can get excited, Lord, to come and to sing praises to your name. Lord, we can come and with our Bibles and our notepads ready to learn and to hear from our God and to know your heart and to know the things that, that took place in the past so that we can learn from the mistakes of the past. And so I pray, Lord God, minister to us uh, tonight, Lord God, whether we're here, whether we're in the foyer, whether we're tuning in online, Lord God, minister to our hearts. I pray that you would move distraction, you would remove disruption so that we can truly give your, give your undivided attention and allow you to teach us your word tonight, Lord. That's our desire. We love you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, if you're not already there, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, okay? Jeremiah chapter 6. We have, we have had such a good time. I know we have. I know I have uh, over the last several chapters as we began this book not too long ago. Uh, and if you missed any of it, I guarantee you want to go back. Uh, from chapter 1 all the way to we, every, every message, every uh, chapter, uh, God has been speaking loud and clear. I hope you're excited. Again, it's all available. If anyone missed it, go back, catch yourself up. Uh, but tonight, we're going to pick it up in chapter 6. Now, as a quick recap, and I need to do this quickly, tonight ends the first section of the book. And so we need to understand when we read chapter 6, what took place in chapters 1 through 5. And so very quickly, let me back up again, remind you what we've learned. Back in chapter 1, remember, it was all about the call and commission of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is believed to be about 20 years old. He was raised in a priestly family. In other words, he would have one day been a priest, but the Lord instead had different plans for him. God called him to be a prophet calling him out to go and to speak to the nations, right? A prophet to the nations. We then saw in chapter 2 the obedience of Jeremiah. He obeys God. He goes out into the streets of Jerusalem and he begins proclaiming what God called him to proclaim. And what's beautiful is, again, he was a young man. Likely very difficult to preach to crowds and especially difficult to tell them something he knew they would not want to hear. But he was more focused on obeying God than pleasing man. And so Jeremiah goes out there, 20 years old, and he begins to proclaim, you might remember, chapter 2, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what God says. And God said, I remember, and that was the key word. You should have ha highlighted that or underlined that in your Bible. God says, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. God told Jeremiah, tell my people, I remember, I remember the honeymoon. I remember when I delivered you from Egypt and I brought you to Mount Sinai and I married you. Remember, they entered into a covenant. God said, I will be your God and, and you will be my people. And the people said, amen. And what did God do? God lovingly provided for them and cared for them and led them through the wilderness and brought them into the promised land. It was beautiful as God demonstrated his love for them and they followed their husband. They followed the Lord. It was beautiful, but it didn't last. Because God went on to say that the people forgot about him. They did not say, where's, where's the Lord? Where's God? Who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. God says, and I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good deeds. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. God says, once I gave you everything that, that you needed, I provided for you, I blessed you, you forgot all about me. And you began, again, to desire the things of this ungodly world. You began to look at your ungodly neighbors and wanted to do the things that they were doing. And they did that. They forgot about their God. And they began to pursue the worship of false gods. And because they were married to God, this was spiritual adultery. That's what they had done to their own husband. The amazing thing is that God is a good God. 
He's an amazing God. He is, he is so much better than any of us deserve, right? Even after all that they had done to him, they're backsliding. They're cheating. They're spiritual cheating on him and worshiping the false things of this world. God told Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 12, Go and proclaim the words toward the north and say, return. And that was the key word of chapter 3. Return, faithless, backsliding Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among the foreigners under every green tree and that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Although they did not deserve it, right? God invited them to come back. He invited his backslidden wife to come back, right? You turned away, now turn back is what God said. He is that good, right? This is God's heart for the backslider to come back. Isn't that beautiful? And this still applies today. But there's one condition. And God made it clear. Remember, verse 13. Only acknowledge your guilt. Only acknowledge that what you did was wrong. You have to understand that you have done wrong. That what you did was rebellion, was disobedience against me. And God has the same requirement today. Yes, he is a loving God who invites all backsliders to come back. But they have to acknowledge their sin. They can't make excuses. They can't blame other people, right? They have to come clean and say, God, I am a sinner. And they have to be willing to change. They cannot continue in that same sinful lifestyle. God says, "Uh uh-uh, you have to acknowledge your sin. You have to acknowledge it was wrong so that you don't do it anymore. This is God's heart. How many of you know that when God wants us to return back to him, he wants us to let the world go, right? To come wholehearted, full-hearted, not half-hearted, not halfway in and halfway out. It's not what God wants. And this is what he commanded them, right? If you really love me, if you really want to come back, I will forgive you. I will receive you. But genuine returning involves genuine repentance, okay? Genuine returning involves genuine repentance, a turning from our sin and a turning to God, which is what God said in chapter 4. If you return, if if, if this is what you're going to do, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return if you remove. And that was the key word of chapter 4. Remove. Remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver. That's what God said. If this is your heart, I will receive you back. But if if you want to come back, you have to cut that stuff loose. You have to turn from your sin. You have to get rid of those things, those things that that are distasteful, that are sinful. God says, no, you have to let it go. And you know what's amazing is that One of the ways that you know someone is truly sorry for their sin is they come clean before God and they say, God, whatever it takes, I'll do it, God. That's a genuine heart, right? Not excuses, not, you know, whatever, anything else. It's God, if you are willing to forgive me, Lord, that is more important to me than than my sin. I will let it go. And this is what God desires, that we remove these things from our life. It's not enough just to say we're sorry, right? We have to make changes. We have to cut these sinful things loose. We can't go back and forth, right? Because people do that over and over again. That's what God said. Do not waver. That's wavering, right? Back and forth, back and forth, in sin, in church, in sin. God says, no, make up your mind. I'll take you back. I'll receive you back. But you got to do your part, okay? God says, I will do mine, but you will do yours. And that brought us to chapter 5. Last week. What did we cover last week? God sent Jeremiah on a spiritual scavenger hunt. Remember that? He says, go and see if you can look for anybody who wants to return. Go and see if you can find at least one person who wants to live right, who seeks after truth. That's what God commanded Jeremiah. Jeremiah returns and he informs God. 
Chapter 5, verse 2. Though they say, as the Lord lives, right? Oh, I serve God. I serve the living God. Yet they swear falsely. They're lying to themselves. Oh, Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You have struck them down, but they felt no anguish. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. What's the key word in chapter 5? Refused. Notice the R's. I'm hoping you guys are picking up on this, right? They refuse to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. God gave them every opportunity. He is that good. He is that loving. And though they claimed, right, that they had come clean with God, they were lying. They were deceiving themselves, and they were lying to God. That's what they were doing. Sad. Because deep down inside, even though they acted like they wanted God, they refused to repent. Their sin was more important to them than being in a right relationship with their God. And it's sad. It is sad. This is where we pick it up. This is where we pick it up in chapter 6, which again is the last chapter in this section. Because they refused to repent... They have nothing but judgment coming. Do we understand that the wages of sin is death? God is good, right? God won't force anyone. God will allow people to serve him or to choose the world. They can do that all they want. What's the old saying? You can pick your sin, but you can't pick your consequence, right? The only thing they would have now coming was God's judgment. That's what they deserved. And that's what chapter 6 is all about. Tonight, if you're taking notes, the certainty of judgment. The certainty of coming judgment. Again, we'll cover chapter 6 and wrap up this section of the book of Jeremiah. We're going to look at the Lord's rejection, get this, of those who reject him. Write that down. The Lord's rejection of those who reject him. This is what happens. If you reject God, he will reject you. We better understand that. First thing we look at is the warning of judgment to come. This is how we begin in chapter 6. The warning of judgment to come. Jeremiah says, Flee for safety, O people of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on Beth Harakim. For disaster looms out of the north and great destruction." Now understand that history tells us that the destruction that Jeremiah is speaking would eventually take place about 20 years later. History tells us that. And yet, notice, he is speaking as if judgment has already begun. He's telling them, right, flee for safety. We would say it this way, run for your lives. That's what he's saying. O people of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is so certain that judgment is coming that he speaks as if it's already happened, right? As if it's already happened. And he's telling them, you better do something, right? Run for your lives. Flee for safety. And what's interesting is notice, he starts with, O people of Benjamin. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why would he do that? Well, if you remember from chapter 1, verse 1, Jeremiah was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he begins, very important, he begins this warning, this message of warning to his own people, to his own relatives, to his own family, to his own neighbors. Very, very interesting. Well, he goes on. He then says, blow the trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal on Beth Harakim. Now, what's he doing? He is instructing the people, right, to get out of Jerusalem. Leave. Run for your lives. Why? Well, he already said, for disaster looms out of the north. And what he's doing, very interesting, is he begins with his own people, his own family, his own relatives, his own neighbors, and then he says, blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Now, what's Tekoa? A couple interesting fun facts, if you ever find yourself on Jeopardy, right? Tekoa was the hometown of the prophet Amos. You might remember that. 
Second thing is Tekoa was the most southern city in Judah prior to the desert beginning. Okay? And so what's he doing? He's starting here in Benjamin in the north. He's telling them, run for your lives. Don't stop at Jerusalem. Keep going south. The judgment is coming from the north. And he says, blow the trumpet in Tekoa, the last city, inhabited city. And then he says, very important, raise a signal. Now, what does that mean? Well, in ancient times, what they would do to alert distant lands, right? Maybe they were too far from hearing the trumpet, is they would light a fire on the top of a mountain. It was a beacon to alert the people of danger, to alert the people to flee. And this is really beautiful what he's doing. He's telling them, right? He's warning them. Judgment is coming. It is on its way. And he starts with his own people. Now, there's a lesson there, isn't there? Shouldn't it start with our own people? Our own family, our own relatives, our own neighbors? That's where the warning should start, right? And then after that, it's got to go out, and we got to tell everybody. It's got to go out as far as, as people will listen. But that's what Jeremiah did, instructs them, right? You have to go. Raise a signal. Tell the people they have to go. And they would light the fire, right? And that fire would lead the way. Light always leads the way in the darkness, right? And he was telling the people, follow the light. Follow the fire. Get out of Dodge. Because judgment is coming. Oh, Lord, help us, right, to pick up on these these lessons. We see the, the heart of the prophet. You know, we don't get to decide how people respond to God's word. That's not up to us. But we still got to tell them. We still have to love them. It is so sad, and it's something that we think about. And Lord, help us, right? May, may this haunt us. That idea that one day, finding ourselves in heaven with people we knew, people we lived near, people we worked with, and we're in one line to make it into heaven, and they're in another line that's not going to heaven. And they look at us across and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you say something? What are you going to say? I didn't want you to, I didn't want to offend you. I didn't want you to get mad at me. Oh, Lord, help us. If your neighbor's house was on fire, would you go and tell them? Or would you say, ah, I just want to mind my own business, right? Lord, help us. Again, we see some some direction here. We see some wisdom here to care enough if we believe that God's judgment is coming. Let me ask you, is God's judgment coming? Then we have a responsibility. We, we, We should take this to heart. Again, if we care about people, I guess we can leave it at that, right? If we care about people. We'll keep reading verse 2. The lovely and delicately bread I will destroy. Now underline the word I because that's very important. Who's talking now? God is talking. God is describing his lovely wife. His lovely and delicate wife whom he had married. And what did God say? That she would face his judgment for refusing to repent and get right with him. Now, it's interesting because, again, a lot of people don't like verses like this, right? They don't want to believe that God judges. They just want to believe in this nice Santa Claus up in the sky. But God makes it crystal clear that those that reject him and rebel against him will face his judgment. This is not Jeremiah's judgment. This is his with the Lord now going on to describe, right, through Jeremiah, the things that would soon take place. Verse 3. Shepherds with their flocks shall come against her. They shall pitch their tents around her. They They shall pasture each in his place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day declines, for the shadows of evening lengthen. Arise and let us attack by night and destroy her palaces. For thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees, cast up a siege mount against Jerusalem. This is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a well weeps its fresh water, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. 
Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you a desolation and an uninhabited land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel like a grape gatherer pass your hand again over its branches. Now what God is describing again is exactly what the Babylonian army would do. And guess what? According to history, this is what they did. And the reason God, through Jeremiah, told his people exactly what Babylon would do was so that when it happened, it would almost be, it would cause them to think like, man, did God tell them what to do? Because that's exactly what they would do. Because God knew exactly what they were going to do. And God told his people ahead of time so that when it was all happening, they would understand they had done this to themselves. They were indeed facing the judgment of God because they refused his invitation. It wasn't what he wanted, but it was what they had chosen for themselves. That Again, God's judgment, just as God said he would judge them. Verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. Take no pleasure in it. Now, this is sad because this is Jeremiah talking. And Jeremiah is having a conversation with God. Look back at how he says this. I I believe we sense some frustration here. Jeremiah says, God, who do you want me to warn, right? Who do you want me to tell? Who do you want me to to give the warning that they would listen? Because their ears are uncircumcised and they cannot listen. Jeremiah is talking like we would. He has been warning and warning and warning, right? The judgment was coming, but nobody paid attention. Nobody heard a word he said. We would say it this way. His message was falling on deaf ears. And so how many of you know that you can only warn so so many times when you begin to be a little discouraged? No one's listening. No one's paying attention, right? He was human just like us. But Jeremiah says the reason they're not listening and the reason they will not listen, notice, is that their ears were uncircumcised. Now, the word uncircumcised, again, don't have to get into the details. We understand that it means covered with flesh. He says their ears are covered with flesh. It's covering. And how interesting. How when our ears are covered by the fleshly things of this world, we won't hear God. We won't hear God. When we have allowed our ears to be filled with the fleshly things of this world, we're going to stop hearing from God. And it is so sad. It is sad to me when I hear Christians say, Pastor, I haven't heard from God in a long time. You know what the problem probably is? You have allowed your ears to be filled with the fleshly things of this world. And when you do, you won't hear God. Your ears are covered to the spiritual things of God because you did this to yourself. But not only that, notice. He says, behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Not only could they not hear the word of God, but they didn't want to hear the word of God. They didn't enjoy it. They found no pleasure in God's word, which makes sense, right? If you have allowed your mind to be filled with the fleshly things of this world, you're not going to desire God's word. You're full of the things of the world. And that's exactly what Jeremiah said. Who do you want me to tell, God? Why am I even telling anybody? They're not only, not only do they not want to listen, they can't listen because they're so full with the things of this world. Let me tell you, if you're not hearing from God, or if you have no desire to hear God's word, it's probably because you're filled with the things of this world. And so what do we do, right? We have to do something. We have to become circumcised in our ears, right? We have to cut out 
the fleshly things again so that we do not fill our minds with the garbage and the things of this world that leave no room for an appetite to hear from our God and to be filled with God's word. Someone say amen to that, right? I think that's important. Verse 11. God says, or or Jeremiah says, Therefore, I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in, right? No one was listening. No one was listening. And he was discouraged from speaking, but he knew he had to speak, right? God had given him a message. He knew he had a duty to pronounce coming judgment. And so I love what he says. He says, I've been holding it in in frustration, but you know what? I'm weary of holding it in. I have to let it out. I have to warn others. I have to tell people that God's judgment is coming. And so what does God say to that? Pour it out. Tell people, right? Warn them, God says. Pour it out upon the children in the street, upon the gatherings of young men. Also, both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and wives together. For I will stretch up my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. God says, Jeremiah, whether they listen or not, whether they respond, whether they repent or not, You have to tell them. You have to tell the young and the old, right? The married and the single, the rich and the poor. You have to tell everybody, Jeremiah, because when my judgment comes, God says, it's going to impact everyone. Can you imagine, again, what it might be like when the tribulation comes? It's going to impact everyone left behind, right? Everybody. Everybody is going to be impacted. Everybody on planet Earth is going to suffer. And it's scary to even imagine. Again, we, you know, we watch these movies and you know, these movies do the best, you know, the best they can do to try to you know, show us what it might be like, but we know that's nothing, right? Nothing compared to how difficult it's going to be. Amen. And so he says, warn them, tell them, from the young to the old, tell everybody why. Because every person on earth, regardless of their age, has a responsibility to either choose or reject God on their own, right? Everybody, the teenagers, the young adults, right? The elderly, everybody, everybody. Everybody has that choice. Everybody must choose for themselves whether they believe or reject what God said. Look at verse 13. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. Now it's so sad because God just declared that he was going to judge all of them. And you almost feel like, why would God do that, right? He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. But God explains. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy. None of them were serving God. They were all selfishly living for themselves. It was all about them, right? They claimed to be the people of God, but all of them lived sinful lives. And from the prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They're all liars. They have healed the wound of my people lightly. If you have a pen, underline lightly. Saying, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Now, one of the saddest things that I think can happen to any church, to any people group, to any nation, is when those people have false teachers leading them. How sad and dangerous that is, right? And your heart goes out to the people. Now, again, it doesn't, you know... Excuse them of their responsibility because God has given all of us his word. But sadly, when there are false prophets and false priests, right, who are serving themselves instead of serving God, they lead people astray. And we know, again, if you've been with us, we covered this already last week, is that this is what was taking place. And what's sad is that had the leaders, had the prophets, had the priests, right, declared the truth of God's word, maybe, just maybe, the people would have listened, right? But they were just like the people. 
They were living just like the people. Again, they were serving themselves just like the people. And so instead of declaring to the people what God said, right? The judgment was coming. What, did the, what were the prophets saying? Notice, peace, peace. When there is no peace. They were lying to the people. The people did not want to hear what Jeremiah said, so they turned to false prophets and said, what do you think? And the false prophet said, there's no judgment coming, right? Jeremiah is just a bunch of hot air. Everything's fine. Don't worry. God loves you just the way you are. Don't worry about anything. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing, and it's so sad, promising peace. Who authorized them to promise peace when God declared judgment in his word? How many of you know, I don't have a choice to decide what to, what to preach, what to teach. I have to teach what God says. And anyone who deviates from that is wrong and is leading the people astray and away from God. I asked you to underline the word lightly because this is, this is pretty cool. Notice this. They, speaking of the, the prophets and priests, these false ones, they have healed the wound of my people lightly. Now, what does that mean? How many of you know that sin is like an infectious wound? Okay? And so here the people were coming before the, the priests and the prophets with their infectious, sinful, spiritual wounds. You with me? And instead of telling the people, you have to deal with that sin, you have to get right with God because that sin is going to kill you, they treated the wound lightly. They put a little Band-Aid on it, right? Oh, don't worry about it. Just ignore it. It'll heal itself. Just ignore it. It'll go away. That's what they did. And it's so sad because the, the prophet's job, right? The pastor's job is to call sin whatever God says is sin, right? So be it. It doesn't matter. And I know we live in a day where, again, you know, maybe I'm going to get kicked off Facebook or whatever it is, right? But I'd rather be kicked out of Facebook than kicked out of heaven. How about that, right? And so that's the reality, right? That's how sad. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They refused to call sin, sin. Telling the people, it's no big deal. It's all right. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry. Don't worry when God had said, right, judgment was coming. Now remember that the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul in, first, in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 3, Paul tells Timothy, Preach the word, Timothy. What word? God's word. Amen? Amen? Give people God's word. Be prepared, he says, in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Notice, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And that's what's happening. You know that's what's happening. I remember my wife telling me years ago, she says, you know what? You recognize, she tells, she tells me, you know that you're never going to have a big church. She says, people will not come to your church to hear what you teach. So be it, right? I'm not in this to have a big church, guys. I'm in this, again, to teach God's word. And if there was 10 of you, or 100, or 200, my message would be the same. That's what it's supposed to be, right? But how sad, right? The big churches, Lord help, Lord help them, right? They have to stand before God. And we've seen the same thing happen today. Paul went on, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, while people are saying there is peace and security. How many of you know, right? Right up into the tribulation that's coming, guys. You're going to have these false teachers saying, God loves you just the way you are. Don't worry. Everything's fine. You can keep living how you're living. And they say there's peace and security. Then suddenly, Paul says, destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. And what does he say? They will not escape. 
It's all here, guys. It's all here. It's sad. and it, it is so true, but we see again, this is the day and age that we're living in. Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. God was justified, guys. God had warned them. He'd given them every opportunity. They didn't want to get right. They instead didn't want to hear God's word. They turned to those that would tell them what they wanted to hear. And for that reason, again, they would face the judgment of God. Let's keep going. Number two. The chances. God is so merciful, right? The chances given to escape the judgment. The chances. Look what God says. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Now what's amazing is here God had told the people And it's almost a picture of of a traveler, someone on a journey, and they find themselves off the beaten path, right? They took a wrong turn, and they found themselves lost and far from where they once were. And God says, that's you guys. You're off the beaten path, right? You got yourself lost. You strayed away from me. But you know what you can do? When you come to the next crossroad, right? You can ask for the ancient path where the good way is and then you can walk in it. God says, there's a way, right? I've given you my word. I've given you my instruction, right? There's a light to direct your path. You can look back at, you know, the the spiritual brothers and sisters that came before us and they walked in the way of God and you can go back and, and do as they did if you want to. But what did they say? Nah. We will not walk in it. Keep reading. Verse 17. I set watchmen over you, God says, saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, nah, we will not pay attention. Now, what was a watchman? Remember what a watchman was, right? A watchman was the soldier on the wall of the city whose job it was to look out And to be on guard at all times. And if they saw uh, an invading army, if they saw coming danger, it was their job to blow the trumpet, right? To alert the people, prepare yourselves for war, right? Get ready. And God had given watchmen, didn't he? Prophet after prophet. He sent prophet after prophet to warn them judgment was coming. Repent before it was too late. They were blowing the trumpet. They were sounding the alarm, right? They didn't want to listen. No one wanted to pay attention. How many people, right? How many people today keep hitting that spiritual snooze button, right? God is calling them, and God is calling them, and they're just hitting that snooze button. And one day they're going to oversleep, and they're going to wake up, and the church is going to be gone. Oh, Lord, help us. That That is so scary. Verse 18. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. God was justified, guys. This was not a mean God. This was not, again, a God who just wanted to punish. He had given them opportunity after opportunity, prophet after prophet. Yes, God is good. Yes, God is loving. But God is holy and he's just, isn't he? And because he is a God of justice, he must punish wrong. He cannot let anyone get away with it. Not even his own children. And that's powerful. Notice again what God did. Verse 18. He's telling the nations. These are the ungodly nations. These are the the Gentiles. He says, therefore, hear, O nations, what will happen to my own people? He's telling the nations, 
So you guys know I'm judging my own people and the same thing if I did it to them, it's going to happen to the whole world. God doesn't play favorites. He is a fair God, but he must punish sin. They had paid not attention to his words. They had rejected it. And if you haven't highlighted it yet, rejected is the key word of chapter 6. They rejected it. Again, they rejected the word of God. And I think we would all understand that if we reject God's word, we will find ourselves in trouble. Verse 20. What use to me is frankincense that comes from Sheba or sweet cane from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices pleasing to me. One of the sad truths that was happening, and I, I believe it happens today, Lord help us, is that people think that as long as they offer sacrifices or they give money to the church, right, or they, you know, do some religious good deed that somehow that makes up for their sin, and God says, okay, you're all right. And God says, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. What was happening, notice this. They would try to show God how much they loved him. And I'm putting that in quotes, of course. They would import frankincense all the way from Sheba. They would import sweet cane from distant land, and then they would offer it to God as a sacrifice. But God says, that's unacceptable. I I can't accept that. If your heart is not in it, if you think that you can disobey me and then make up for it with sacrifices, God says it doesn't work that way. That type of offering, that type of sacrifice is unacceptable. Do we understand that we cannot substitute obedience to God with offerings and sacrifices? With religious deeds, right? Well, as long as I go to church and then, right, I can do whatever I want. At least I went on Sunday. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. And God called them out on it. You might remember... 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed God is better than offering the fat of of rams. God desires more important than our offerings and our sacrifices. God desires obedience. You might remember Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, right? Very, very simple. Let's move on. The consequences they will experience, the consequences they will experience. Verse 21, therefore says the Lord, behold, I will lay before this people stumbling blocks against which they shall stumble. Fathers and sons together, neighbor and friend shall perish Thus says the Lord, behold, a people is coming from the north country. A great nation is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. They lay hold on bow and javelin. They are cruel and have no mercy. They sound of them. The sound of them is like the roaring sea. They ride on horses, set in array as a man for battle against you, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the report of it. Our hands fall helpless. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. Go not out into the field, nor walk on the road. For the enemy has a sword. Terror is on every side. O daughter of my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation. For suddenly the destroyer will come upon us. Consequences. Again, it's not what God wanted. I'm going to keep saying that. It's not what God wanted. He gave them every opportunity, but they chose to reject God's word. They chose not to believe the message that the prophet, or all the prophets, even before Jeremiah, had said. And for that reason, when we fail to listen and heed God's word, we will face the consequences. Let's look at the last thing and we're done. The proof they deserved it, okay? The proof they deserved it. This is really, really interesting. I like this last section, verse 27. 
God speaking. I have made you, Jeremiah, a tester of metals among my people, that you may know and test their ways. They are all stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They are bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. In vain the refining goes on, for the wicked are not removed. Rejected silver they are called, for the Lord has rejected them. Now, let me explain this really, really quick and we're done. What God did here is he used an interesting illustration that they would have totally understood back then. And it was the illustration of refining precious metals. You see, the, 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 the people of Judah considered themselves precious gold and silver, right? That's what they considered themselves. And so God says, Jeremiah, test them. Test them like a refiner. Test them. Test what type of metal they are. Well, the way I guess it worked as I read it is that the refiner, what he would do is he would take the metal and he would heat up the fire, the crucible, and then the bellows would blow the, the hot air, right, to melt the metal. Then the refiner would add a piece of lead. Very interesting. He would add a piece of lead to the gold or the silver. And then the lead would oxidize and it would cause all of the impurities from the gold or the silver to leave the gold or the silver and to mold itself onto the lead. And then he would simply get the lead and discard it and he would be left with pure gold or pure silver. It's the way the refining process worked. And so get this picture very quickly. Jeremiah came, and with the fire of judgment, right, he preached judgment is coming to warn them. And he was operating like a bellow, right, blowing that hot air, the fire, the warning to see if, again, the impurities would leave, to see if they would cut loose, right, the sin from their life. But did they? No. No. You see, what happened is the refining process did not work in them. Why didn't it work? Why didn't the impurities leave the silver or gold? Well, the answer is the people of God were not silver or gold. They were junk metal. They considered themselves precious before God, but they had become so wrapped up in the impure things of this world, that that's all that they were. And that is so sad, right? That is so sad. And so what did the refiner do when he looked and there was no silver or gold left, but nothing but junk metal? He grabbed it and he threw it into the scrap pile. And that's exactly what God said would happen to them. Why? Notice, because they were rejected silver. For the Lord has rejected them. What a lesson. That's powerful. Lord, help us, right? Lord, help us to check our heart. Lord, help us to be careful, right? That we do not allow the impure things of this world to contaminate our lives so that we become junk. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Every chapter, Lord, every verse, precious with lessons for all of us, even today, Lord God. Anyone who says the Old Testament is not for us, oh, they haven't read the Old Testament. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for these warnings. Lord, I pray we would understand your word is true. Everything you said through Jeremiah it came to pass. Just as, Lord God, the things that Paul has spoken about, the things that our Lord Jesus spoke about in regards to the tribulation judgment that is coming, will come to pass as well. Lord, I thank you that you are such a good God. You are a merciful God. Despite how far we have fallen, despite how far the backslider, backslider might find themselves from you, you invite them back. If we will acknowledge our sin and turn from it, Lord, you will receive us back, Lord God. Thank you, you are that good. Thank you, you are a God of second and third and a, and a hundred chances. And I pray, Lord God, that we would have wisdom 
not only to hear your word, but to heed it so that we would escape the coming judgment. We love you. We thank you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray.